Hello, everyone. My name is Matthias Risse, and I am the director of the Carl Center for Human Rights Policy here at the Harvard Kennedy School. And it is uh, my honor and great pleasure to welcome you to what I think is our very last or at least one of the very last events uh, for this whole academic year. And it is a very special uh, event uh, that we are doing today on the occasion of the publication of Bill Schulz's new book, uh, Reversing the Rivers, a memoir of history, hope and human rights, the official release date of that book actually was uh, May 16th, so it's now officially out. Uh, you can acquire it at um, you know lots of places. So there's also a link to a discount uh, in the confirmation email for this event that we um, that we send around. So not only can you acquire it, you specifically who are on this event right now can acquire it for something like a 15% discount. So it's all in that email. Um, as the uh, it is as the subtitle suggests, um, a memoir, uh, but it's not just any memoir, but it is the story of a life in the human rights movement. So it is about that about Bill's life, and it is about the how that life helped shape the human rights movement, and how the human rights movement helped shape then also uh, that life. Um, Bill William Schultz uh, is a man of whom it has been said, and rightly so that he has done more than anyone in the American human rights movement to make human rights issues actually known in the United States. As many of you will know, uh, there is a, a much stronger, uh, or there is, a, there is certainly a very strong civil rights tradition and a, and a, a, ling a linguistic take on, uh, on, on rights issues in terms of civil rights rather than human rights. So this is, this is actually a highly non-trivial effort to bring human rights issues also under that name into the uh, American uh, discourse. I would also like to emphasize here uh, that it is really a great honor for me as the director of an academic institution here uh, to be able to honor one of the great practitioners uh, of the of the human rights movement. Places like ours here, the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy, uh, have a role to play uh, in the uh, in reg with regard to the human rights rights movement, largely because we are there to. Uh, support and encourage uh, the kind of work to accompany the kind of work that people like Bill do to identify future leaders, to convene future leaders. So um, we have uh, decidedly a contributory role to the kind of work that, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and you know, not not exactly. You know, so we we have a well defined role there, but you know what matters at the end of the day, of course, is the work done in the trenches, uh, and that is the kind of work that uh, that Bill has done. So this this event, I also distinctly mean as a way of conveying much gratitude, um, not, not just myself, but I think on behalf of very many people for the amazing work that uh, Bill has done uh, for, he's right there, so Bill, that you have done for, <laughs> for, for the human rights movement over all these, uh, all, all these years. Bill has served as the executive director uh, of Amnesty International uh, USA from 1994 to 2006. He is a native of Pittsburgh, uh, which creates a bit of a fun fact opportunity for me, because one thing I realized uh, by, by uh, reading Bill's book that his American roots are exactly the same as my American roots. Uh, and what that means is that uh, Bill went to high school uh, to a place called Shadyside uh, Academy, about which uh, he has some really intriguing things to say. So Shadyside Academy is in a part of Pittsburgh known as Shadyside, um, which is also where I lived uh, many years after Bill was at Shadyside Academy. Uh, so I did have nothing to do with the academy, but I lived in Shadyside, sharing a house with a group of rather wild Carnegie Mellon University art students. And that was my very first year in the United States uh, in 1993 to 94 when I was a visiting student in the Cathedral of Learning, which is the main building of the University of Pittsburgh, which was roughly the time when Bill started as executive director of uh, Amnesty uh, USA. Now, um, one important thing to understand about Bill's work there, and there's a lot of important things to understand, but just one thing to begin with is that Bill developed Amnesty International USA into an organization that paid more attention to human rights in the United States than, than the organization itself had done before. So it's not just that human rights are a bit of a latecomer to the rights discourse in the United States. It's also that Amnesty International as an organization has a certain kind of impartiality constraint that at least strongly encourages organizations, its chapters in particular countries, not to concern themselves with that very country, but with people 
prisoners of conscience, people suffering from political oppression in other parts of the country, which also concerns and create certain uh, difficulties in, in attracting people uh, to do this kind of work. And, you know, there's, of course, often questions, doesn't the United States have a set of its own human rights issues? Of course, it does. And Bill has done a lot of work to draw attention also from within Amnesty International USA to, to uh, those issues. Amnesty International, many of you will know, is an organization that comes from the early 1960s as uh, the great grassroots organization in the human rights world. It's one of the two major human rights NGOs in the world. The other one is Human Rights Watch, but Human Rights Watch has a very different uh, mode of being than uh, than Amnesty. Amnesty really is a is a grassroots organization, and it was built um, by Peter Benenson originally in the early 60s around this idea that people over here should show concern of an impartial sort for people over there, right? and kind of thereby expressing this uh, universal universality idea uh, of human rights uh, in 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 a grassroots manner at a at a global scale. The book begins um, with Bill's childhood in Pittsburgh, though it's actually rather brief on that. So the book is really mostly about the work and, you know, talks about Bill's life really mostly to the extent that Bill wants to reveal who he is and how this connects to the work. It's, it is mostly about the work. Um, and also brings in a lot of thoughts. The, the book throughout uh, brings in also, um, so Bill has a degree in philosophy and the philosopher in Bill is distinctly the second character to the practitioner in Bill, but it also that the philosopher is clearly there. So there is a lot of fascinating reflections about the nature and the, uh, the functionality of evil. And the book also contains, I really encourage you, so when you buy it, read all the way to the end, read the appendix, because this is a really nice user manual of how to deal with the usual kind of objections, concerns, reservations that people have about human rights. And Bill just sums up a lifetime of conversational practice uh, there. So this is actually the kind of thing one could easily assign in a in a human rights class as a shorthand for a lot of interesting uh, debates. So but then no sooner had Bill started at Amnesty in 94 than the genocide in Rwanda started. Rwanda, so of course now we know Rwanda much more because there was a genocide, but at the time it was uh, it was a country that many decision makers in the West uh, could barely locate uh, on, a, on a map, but then truly horrendous things started to unfold there, the speed of genocide much higher than any other in the century riddled with genocides. Uh, and that happened basically within a few weeks um, after Bill took up his position uh, at Amnesty. And from there, the book explores issues around the designation of prisoners of conscience, which is a central category for the work of amnesty over which the London headquarters reserves close control. And Bill has some intriguing parallels there to the imperial, to the, the, the you know, the imperial British past, you know, the headquarters in London. And so this was is an important issue also of uh, sometimes tensions in the amnesty world that these designations are made from London and the research is done uh, in London. The book then talks about various country visits by Amnesty delegations that critically included Bill. So there's one important kind of work that, that Amnesty does, these country visits. Uh, and uh, they took Bill to difficult places uh, like Northern Ireland, like Darfur and Liberia. So one of the most harrowing uh, reads uh, in the book is a number of chapters about uh, Bill's uh, visit to Liberia, beginning with the complications of even getting there, uh, then moving around there safe, safely in the country, getting out safely, living uh, with the looming threats of Charles Taylor, the then dictator uh, of um, uh, of Liberia. Um, you know, good good thing to note here. Bill is with us on the screen. Uh, Charles Taylor is in a prison somewhere, so that was a successful. That all ended well, but it, it it wasn't clear from how it unfolded that it would end as well. So these visits, of course, and this is really something that's what I mean by work on the trenches, these visits come with enormous personal risks for the people who undertake them. Uh, the book talks about the complexities of addressing human rights in Israel-Palestine, something I hope we'll have some time to talk about, and walks the reader in often very personal ways through Bill's encounters with the American criminal justice system. You know, white, uh, a white guy from Pittsburgh uh, had an enormous, uh, you know, in a way that speaks to my my white guy from Pittsburgh experience too. There's, you know, there's things one needs to acquire, things one needs to understand about the racial dimensions, about the American criminal justice systems, but generally also about the human rights dimensions uh, of um, uh, in that field, police practices, prison system, use of death penalty, of course, a major issue for amnesty for many years. 
Uh, the racist overtones of all of that are very strongly addressed in the uh, in the book. Uh, we learn about Amnesty International's engagement with the mainstreaming of torture after September 11th, but we also learn about many encounters of very different qualities, sometimes quite comical, sometimes quite depressing, often very uplifting with celebrities ranging from Lauren Bacall, Richard Gere, Martin Sheen, Angelina Jolie, Patrick Stewart, uh, George Clooney, Mohammed Ali, Sama Hayek, and quite a number of Kennedys. So if you want a autograph from one of these guys, send an email directly to Bill. He is still using that old Yahoo address. Uh, you know, not many people are doing that, but Bill is, you know, he is rigid about that. Uh, maybe he can do something for you. Uh, and we also get an inside scoop on why large human rights organizations can actually be very difficult places to work. And that is also, I greatly appreciated the honesty and the assessment there. That is a topic not much discussed uh, in the human rights world, but I think it's good to do an honest reckoning and I hope we have time to do that. So we really get a full-fledged account of what it was like to lead a major human rights organization in the United States through all the turmoil that, account, that, uh, that occurred around the turn of the century. Let me also mention here, Bill is the author of a number of other books, including The Coming Good Society, Why New Realities Demand New Rights, which came out in 2021, which was co-authored with Sushma Raman, the previous executive director of the Car Center. Uh, and which is a book about how new realities of the Universal Declaration, as you will all know, is from 1948. And many things have happened since then. The human rights movement, to its great credit, is an enormously dynamic movement. And uh, this book is making a major contribution to assessing where these dynamics are going or should be going. Bill, uh, finally, is also a ordained Unitarian Universalist minister. And maybe at some point, Bill, you can explain to laymen like me what Unitarian Universalists are. I'm a good old fashioned Catholic, or at least I brought, was brought up there. The other guys are always just the Protestants. So, you know, what Unitarian Universalists are. Anyway, maybe mention it in a, in a, in a, in a sideline at some point. And he was the uh, president of the Unitarian Universalist Association um, uh, of Congregations between 85 and 93. So, right before his move to Amnesty, he now lives in Gloucester, Massachusetts. Uh, which is a, um, a, a part of the state that has a way of creating great loyalties in their inhabitants. So you rarely hear anybody praise as much heap on their as, as much praise heap as much praise, sorry, uh, on their municipality as people from Gloucester. And then, of course, the single most important thing to say about Bill is that he was a senior fellow at the that he has been a senior fellow at the supportive not only of the human rights mission at large, but also specifically about what we're doing here at the Car Center. So with that, with that, with all that said, uh, let me um, encourage the audience to put your questions uh, in the in the chat. We will be screening, monitoring that, integrating that. But for now, let me turn it over to Bill just with this with my opening question. Can you tell us a bit about the story of the book? What made you decide to write it? How did you choose this range of topics, this take on Bill Schultz's work? And why did you choose this particular title? Over to you, Vakam Bill. Well, thank you, Matthias, uh, for that very rich uh, and wide-ranging introduction. Uh, I uh, want to thank you not only for hosting this, but in the years that I've been at the Carr Center, this is the third book that I've written with the assistance and support of the center. And uh, I'm about to retire from that capacity, but it's been a very rewarding one, and I'm very grateful to you and everyone else associated with Carr. Uh, Joyce Carol Oates in her gothic tale, Belle Fleur, has a wonderful comment about history, and I want to get it right. She says, uh, is history beset by tragedy or merely farce, by melodrama or pranks of fate that cannot be deciphered? And I left Amnesty 17 years ago, and I figured that 17 years was long enough to figure out to what extent my experience there were, was an example of tragedy, and there was, of course, tragedy aplenty, and to what extent it was an exemplar, exemplary of farce. And there certainly were some elements of farce as well. I make clear in the introduction that this is not a history of human rights in the United States. It's not a history of amnesty. Uh, it's an attempt to talk from my idiosyncratic perspective about experiences in which I was involved directly. And uh, it describes, therefore, the heroes and the villains with whom I consorted in one fashion or another, 
And it also, as you've implied, attempts to address some fundamental philosophical issues that all of us in human rights inevitably confront. What is the nature of evil? Uh, whether there is any excuse for torture, is the sanction against torture as simple as it seems, and a, a good many others. Uh, I want to say a word about the title, the title Reversing the Rivers, uh, comes from a quote from the uh, Russian writer uh, Nadezhda uh, Mandelstam uh, from a book by uh, my former colleague and friend Josh Rubenstein. She wrote to her husband Osip uh, before he died in a Siberian gulag. She wrote, you know, there's a tendency to accuse you of not reversing the rivers, of not changing the course of the stars, of not breaking up the moon in honey cakes and feeding us the pieces. In other words, people wanted the impossible from you, for you, from you, and were angry when you just did the possible. And I had a sense that. Uh, that that's exactly what human rights work is like. Uh, it's as difficult as trying to reverse the rivers. People ask human rights workers and activists and scholars to do the impossible, and they get angry when they, that's all they can do. But uh, what we can do is to make that river a little cleaner, uh, to make its course a little wider, and its waters a common favor for us all. And that's what I hope uh, I was able to make a modest contribution to in my years of amnesty. Thank you, Bill. Let me ask you one other thing about the, the book. Um, one thing I find very intriguing uh, is the, uh, the epigraph uh, taken from the, the Jewish tradition. Um, it says, do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now, live mercy now, walk humbly now. And then the most intriguing part, are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. You know, that's a, that's, I think that is that speaks to a lot of us, and I think it speaks to the spirit in which you have written the book, and at the end of the book, you come back to a theme like that. Can you can you elaborate maybe a little bit also, you know, how why you chose this as the epigraph and what it says about your attitude and the attitude that you are recommending to others to this kind of work? Well, I, I guess I'll respond to that in the form of one of my favorite little stories that I often told when I was speaking for Amnesty. It's of uh, it's of the little bird who was seen one day lying in the road with its feet straight up in the air. When a when a passerby saw it, it, it asked it what it was doing, and the little bird said, uh, "I hear that the sky is falling. The sky is falling." And the passerby said. Well, maybe so, but what good will your little feet do to stop the sky from falling? And the little bird said, well, you do what you can. You do what you can. And I think that this tracks the, the, uh, the, the quote that I used to title the book. Uh, the world's grief is enormous. The tragedy is enormous. Um, we'll never eliminate it, but we have an obligation to do what we can. <laughs> we have an obligation to do what we can. And then there's this other theme, actually, the, um, um, so sorry, the, the end of your book actually kind of complements that rather than picking up on that, right? So the, the last lines uh, says, say, insisting that no matter how hard the tyrants try it, like, so it's, I'm kind of reading this in the middle of something, life was too short to stop. It's shining elusive virtues, just too sweet, too sweet to lose. How lucky I have been. So there's also... You know, as, as somebody who occasionally teaches a class on the meaning of life, um, I find that uh, quite intriguing. So uh, you you are not only saying, uh, you're saying various things, right? There is this work, it needs to be done. We're not obligated to complete it, but we're not allowed to let it go. But there's also a lot of satisfaction in doing that. So you are a happy man for the work you have done. Is that a correct uh, statement? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I'm certainly a grateful man. That's probably the most accurate way to describe it, whether happy or not, certainly grateful. I mean, I'm I'm 73 years old. My active professional life is uh, edging toward a close. Uh, I hope that I've made a contribution that I can, but mostly what I feel now uh, is a wonder at the glory of creation. I mean, you know, as I always tried to say to folks, if you don't first love the world as it is, what reason do you have for trying to save it? Mm -hmm. uh, and there's that wonderful quote from E.B. White about his, being conflicted every morning when he gets up between trying to save the world and savoring it. 
Mm. And I think those two go together. One, one saves a world that one cares about, that one has savored as well. Yeah. I can, uh, and of course, this is not the, uh, we have had many interactions and, you know, I can tell your, communi your, com your communication approach, uh, you know, comes as has been, has been uh, developed in many years of practice of actually talking to people, you know, you, you actually, you want to reach them, right? You, and, and storytelling helps with that and comparisons, parables, refer you know, this is, this, this kind of thing greatly helps to actually get to get things into people's minds. Uh, can you maybe let's talk a little bit about the um, the organization? So your your role in that. Um, so um, you know, somewhat naive question: what what does an executive director of Amnesty International USA do on a kind of day to day, week by week, month by month basis? So uh, Amnesty is a very complex organization, as you alluded uh, in your introduction. Uh, the International headquarters are in London. They've now uh, expanded around the world in terms of uh, international staff. But when I was there, it was fundamentally a London-based organization. Amnesty USA was the largest of the national sections. Uh, it was an important section, but it often uh, had conflict with the international movement over such things as the work on own country restrictions that you've also commented on in your introduction. The job of an executive director is of course, uh, like that in any uh, nonprofit organization, you raise money, you're a spokesperson for the organization, you hire and fire people, you uh, administer the organization, and in Amnesty's case, you're a principal interface between the national section and the international movement. It was a fantastic job. I, I loved it. I can't say I loved every minute of it. There were lots of headaches. Uh, I was on the road about 75, 80% of the time. A very demanding job, but a very rewarding one as well. Yeah. And one thing that it involves, so uh, one reason to be on the road is international trips um, to uh, rather troubled places like uh, Liberia. Can you maybe talk a little bit about what is the context of such visits? Why does, why does Amnesty uh, do such visits? How did you end up being part of that? And maybe a couple of kind of key points to take away is from, from again, the, this, uh, one of the, my most favorite passages from the book, but also partly because it's so harrowing. So um, Amnesty has a policy, at least it did when I'm the, uh, I was there, that it never goes into a country without the knowledge and the permission of the government. It doesn't uh, engage in any kind of subterfuge. And so that means that often Amnesty is not allowed into certain countries but it tries to go into countries, particularly countries at risk of massive human rights violations at critical times. And in the case of Liberia, it was uh, in the run up to an election. The country was in the middle of a horrendous civil war uh, and uh, amnesty to, to our own surprise in some respects was given permission to go in despite the fact that it was, as you said in your introduction, a very dangerous place. Uh, whether we actually did any good or not, I don't know, but uh, we certainly worked very closely with the local human rights activists. You mentioned the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church in Liberia was a very important player. Women in Liberia, women leaders were very, very important there in uh, uh, providing countervailing power to Charles Taylor and the, those in, in, uh, in control at that time of the government. Of course, eventually, uh, those local activists managed to, in some ways, transform that country. Mm -hmm. uh, Ellen Sirleaf Johnson becoming uh, the first woman president of an African country. Uh, and uh, obviously, the country, uh, while still having horrendous problems, is no longer uh, at, at risk of any kind of massive genocide, at least for the moment. I will uh, say a word more about the story because people may be wondering, since you referred to it, uh, mm -hmm. I led this organization because, of course, of the longstanding relationship historically between the United States and Liberia. Mm -hmm. And when we went there, uh, one of the uh, reporters who was on a paper that opposed Charles Taylor's election as president asked me whether uh, Amnesty believed that war criminals should run for president, should be allowed to run for president. And knowing that I should not take any political positions, I explained that Amnesty didn't endorse or Oppose any particular candidate, but of course we believe war criminals should be brought to justice. And uh, in the uh, next day, in the headlines uh, of that paper, uh, Charles Taylor may not run for president, says 
Dr. Schulz of Amnesty International. So I went into the editor and I said, you've got to correct that. That's not what I said. And I explained what I had. Oh, we understand, they said. The next day, the headlines, you will be booked, Charles Taylor. So uh, Taylor and his minions were not happy with that. And uh, they met with some of my amnesty colleagues and they uh, said, Mr. Taylor is very concerned for Dr. Schulz's health. And he suggests that he keep his eye on his back uh, in New York. So uh, I didn't take that very seriously, but it is indicative of the fact that you're dealing with some very, very uh, rough, horrendous yeah. characters in this work. Yeah, yeah. And this episode is actually also quite striking as an illustration for the very difficult navigating that an organization that specifically Amnesty always have to do. Right? I think the, the, the way you, do, you handled this particular conversation really was quite brilliant by saying we're not taking a stance on the presidential elections. We are not political in that sense, at least, right? But, you know, we, we, we stand for something, right? We do stand for having people brought uh, to justice. And that's a sticky topic for Amnesty also when it comes to the selection of prisoners of conscience, right? So there's, uh, uh, maybe you can elaborate on that, but the, uh, you know, one, one, one person that comes to mind, Nelson Mandela, or maybe that was not even one of the great headache topics, right? So Nelson Mandela, Nelson Mandela never became a prisoner of conscience for Amnesty because the fact that he was actually involved in, sabotage activities at a certain stage in apartheid South Africa basically disqualified him. So there was this, this distinction between the political and the pristineness of certain kind of activities, uh, hard to draw, hard to maintain, often difficult to address in conversational contexts such as the one that you just quoted for Liberia. Yes, well, I think uh, prisoners of conscience, POCs, are, were Amnesty's stock and trade from the beginning of the organization in 1961. And the founder of Amnesty defined them very clearly. I want to get the quote, quote exactly right. Uh, he uh, said that a prisoner of conscience is any person who is physically restrained from expressing any opinion which he honestly holds and who does not advocate or condone violence. Well, you know, read literally, uh, that means that even someone who expresses uh, a support for genocide, as long as he doesn't act on it, uh, could be declared a prisoner of conscience. Uh, it was uh, a controversy over Alexei Navalny, who had been known in years past to have expressed xenophobic positions. Uh, and Amnesty, of course, had declared him a prisoner of conscience and then uh, waffled on that and then finally added uh, to the requirements that it be uh, someone who has not advocated hatred as well. And that uh, is an important escape clause. But you're absolutely right. Because of the issue of uh, not advocating violence, Nelson Mandela was never declared a prisoner of conscience. That was a very controversial issue. There is, of course, a distinction between political prisoners and prisoners of conscience. Uh, and uh, that's an important distinction to maintain. There's no question, of course, that Nelson Mandela was a political prisoner. Uh, whether he was a prisoner of conscience uh, may be up for debate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Navalny uh, is, right, so th that's actually an interesting contrast, right? So Mandela, in Mandela's case, one, one wonders, I wonder, often requires explaining, right? Given the Mandela that later he turned into, right? It always requires explaining that there was this earlier Mandela and so that Amnesty's decision was actually not that strange in terms of the standards it said. Um, uh, Navalny is an interesting case kind of the other way, right? So where you did make the decision to make him, uh, to declare him a prison of conscience. But I had, you know, some interesting exchanges with uh, some Ukrainian visitors about this actually a little while ago. We had a, com a conference here, a student-run conference uh, called the European Conference, happens every year, had a focus on Ukraine this, this year. And I brought up with them Navalny, I said, you know, there's this other Russia, you know, there's, there, there might be, you know, we try to identify hopes in Russia, and I brought up Navalny, and the Ukrainians were not happy about him, uh, be, because of, you know, the xenophobic, so, you know, he was supportive of the annexation of the of the Krim, you know, the, the peninsula. So, can you say a little bit more about why, the, the, so in Navalny's case, this kind of thing hasn't bothered you? Well, first, I should say that that case came after I was at Amnesty, so I can't. Oh, yeah. I can't speak uh, about Amnesty's position on that. I can I can just speak in general. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, prisoners of conscience, as I say, this is the stock and trade, not only of the organization, it's, it's a, a level of uh, conscience 
a level of, of purity and of action that obviously we all want to respect and, and protect to the extent to which we can. But I think it's important to recognize that prisoners of conscience are not bodhisattvas. They're not mm -hmm. saints. Uh, and some of them uh, have engaged after they were free in behavior that many of us would not uh, admire. Mm. Uh, and to hold prisoners of conscience to that kind of standard, uh, yeah. well, it's the same debate as whether we should read the works of authors who have uh, taken controversial mm. positions or, or done things that we certainly want to condemn. Yeah. Uh, if we stick to the notion of political prisoners, I think think we are on considerably safer ground. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that uh, this this reference that that prisoners of conscience are not bodhisattvas, that's also in the books as to, to explain. So bodhisattvas are these figures in Buddhism that are these, you know, these kind of pure humans, right? So they give guidance. Yeah? So if, if you want to escape from all the suffering and come to this new stage of being human, you get orientation from them. So they play a bit of the parallel role to what in the Catholic Church are the, the saints. And I think here it's important to understand, you know, the human rights movement is a humanist movement. It's concerned with human, with humans, with human affairs, with human capacity. So in a way, the status of the of the model human cannot have that level of purity just because we would be giving up on the complexity of human character altogether. Is that a exactly. Yeah. exactly. Let's talk then about the topic in, in the neighborhood of this. And um, by the way, let me encourage the, the viewers again, please do put your questions in the chat. I'm very happy, very eager to integrate them in our conversation. Um, but one topic in this neighborhood and the, what the purity standards are is humanitarian intervention. So humanitarian intervention is, is a headache topic kind of all over the place for the UN to begin with, right? So the charter of the UN is very clear that the only legitimate cause for war is self-defense. And then what about scenarios when there's a, you know, there's a catastrophic breakdown of governance or just a terrible government, but they're not doing anything to anybody else. So self-defense reason wouldn't kick in for other countries, but they're doing horrible things domestically. So that's the motivation for humanitarian intervention in, in international in international affairs generally. And of course, it prevents prevent, it. It creates an enormous uh, headache also for an organization like Amnesty. Can you maybe share a little bit about the debates that you have had internally about that topic, Bill? Yeah. So when I came to Amnesty, you know, I'm of the uh, Vietnam War era. So I came with a predilection for the notion that intervention ought to be kept to a minimum and that it was always something that we ought to be suspicious about. I had opposed the first Persian Gulf War, for example, when I was head of the Unitarian Universalist Association. But Rwanda really changed my mind. And I, I think that uh, if uh, one truly confronts the fact that had Romeo Dallaire, the Canadian general who was uh, uh, subsumed to the United uh, Nations at that point, uh, if he was right, that had he be, been given 2,000 soldiers, he could have saved hundreds of thousands of lives, given that many of those lives were ended with such uh, weapons as um, machetes, for example. Uh, then one could hardly, uh, with conscience, oppose intervention. Now, human rights organizations, quite understandably, are resistant to endorse military intervention. Why? Well, uh, several reasons. One, uh, because intervention uh, is uh, inevitably to take sides, to take political sides. If you call for uh, intervention to protect Ukraine, you're clearly taking a political side, and uh, human rights organizations are hesitant to do that. Uh, the second reason is that on the only legal intervention is, of course, with authorization from the UN Security Council, and that's very, very difficult to obtain. Um, it's because even the most virtuous military forces may well uh, commit what have to be described as war crimes. And if a human rights organization has endorsed that intervention and then the military forces commit war crimes, obviously that puts the organization in a very difficult uh, position and it makes it more difficult to call out war crimes. Yeah. Uh, and so I think a good example is the Kosovo War which the UN Commission on Kosovo eventually declared to have been illegal because it was not authorized uh, by the Security Council, but legitimate. And uh, similarly, I think that the, the French intervention in Rwanda, it was illegal, 
but uh, I think it saved a good many lives. So this is the complication that we always struggled with. I think Amnesty is now more flexible. Amnesty is a growthful organization, more yeah. flexible on this question than when I was there, but it is obviously an ongoing quandary for any human rights advocate. Yeah, yeah. Let me uh, draw, uh, bring our conversation to another ongoing quandary in the human rights world, and that is uh, reporting on Palestine, Israel. Uh, there's really also, there's also some fascinating discussion uh, in your book in there, and uh, the, the, this whole issue, of course, also came up um, in, uh, in at the Kennedy School in, in recent times around the appointment of Ken Roth, so the uh, you know Human Rights Watch, you know the other big organization in the in the in uh, in the human rights world uh, has has similar challenges and similar internal disputes about how to uh, deal with human rights violations there and one one way one one position in this debate um, is, is uh, so some people say um, the human human rights organization should not so should not strongly focus the way they do uh, on human rights violations of Israel, because Israel has all these great things going for itself. It's a, it's a functioning democracy. Uh, it has uh, a spectrum of opinion, freedom of the press, and all these things. There's problems there, but it is functioning way better as a democracy than just about than just about any other country in that region. Is that really? I mean, there's kind of there's kind of two concerns, right? Is this is this a is this a good use of your energy to focus on a country that is good in all these ways, uh, and uh, and b aren't you thereby also in a way undermining certain the efforts of this country to maintain its democracy? So this I'm just kind of quoting that as a position that is a recognizable view in this debate, and I'd just be eager to hear your thoughts on that. So there's no question that this was among the most controversial issues. And no matter uh, which side uh, Amnesty and no doubt Human Rights Watch reported on, and the organizations both tried to be quite even handed here and report both on violations by Israel and by the Palestinians, uh, no matter what, we, we were uh, lambasted uh, uh, about our reporting here. Um, I think that the argument, first of all, of course, there's considerable question as to the extent to which Israel is fully democratic, at least uh, for its own uh, Arab citizens. Uh, but quite apart from that issue, uh, I think the notion that one gives a country a pass on human rights violations uh, because it is democratic or because it has other admirable features would mean that uh, the United States should itself receive a pass with regard to its human rights violations, be they uh, with regard to the police or the use of the death penalty or whatever it may be. Uh, that's not the way human rights organizations can operate. I think that the, the problem here uh, is, apart from the politics and uh, the sympathies that uh, many people have for both communities, I think the problem is that you are dealing with highly traumatized communities of people, both Israeli and Palestinian. And when you are dealing with highly polarized and highly traumatized organizations, the intervention of third parties is always going to be controversial and delicate. Mm. Uh, and sometimes I think human rights organizations have intervened with a blunderbuss rather than with delicacy. Uh, but I think on balance, uh, Amnesty at least, and I would say this is true of Human Rights Watch, have done their best uh, to be as even-handed as possible in a situation that even even-handedness is suspect uh, mm. by both parties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I uh, I completely agree on all of that. I, um, I frustrating features of this whole this whole discourse around Israel Palestine is that uh, too many people are, you know, aiming to make like one bottom line statement, or when they look at the history of the conflict, they you know might even take an enlightened approach to that, and they say, yeah, a lot of things have gone wrong, but the the real evil was committed by this group and it started then, right? So they want to somehow kind of nail it to one thing committed by one side. Uh, but I think one really important thing about this here is there's just a lot of complexity and often one needs to say a bunch of things and they're all true together, right? There's a, uh, and also involving uh, the role of outside observers, right? So this is obviously a part of the world that is very, you know, because of the sp spiritual role that it has is, is important to many people and, so, you know, it's how to report about that, how to talk about this, what to recognize uh, is, a, is, a, is a difficult subject. 
Well, and, and I think it reinforces the importance of the original amnesty ideal, which is that you have disinterested observers, researchers, experts, who truly are going to call it uh, as they see it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, of course, we're all human beings and we all have biases of one kind or another. Yeah. And in the case, of course, of Israel, Israel, uh, uh, it's more e it's easier to obtain information. Sometimes Israel is the more powerful party. Therefore, it is likely that it may be the party that commits a disproportionate number of violations that have to be reported on. But it's a very, very complicated and difficult situation that requires, as I say, delicacy and sensitivity, sensitive yeah. to the trauma on both sides. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, this is also as good occasion as any to just really emphasize how important additions to global politics, the existence of uh, hum the, the international human rights organizations is, right, and domestic human rights organizations that we have. You know, if you think about what civil society, what that actually is, right, that you have in addition to states and state entities and inter interstate entities, in addition to all that and individuals, also these organizations of individuals that are not state entities, but still can put pressure on, can exercise power, can do things in the world. That is something that we just didn't have before uh, the 20th century in any any serious way, right? So. This is really something that uh, you know information technology and connectivity of the 20th century has made possible and that is why organizations like human rights watch and uh, and uh, and amnesty are such important and you know does anybody imagine you know subtracting them and and the red cross right from 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 the world and how you know in spite of all the shortcomings right but you know what would the world be like if those were removed you know well you make a very good point and and I, you know we often hear criticism of the human rights movement and regimen, uh, its weakness, its failures, and so on. Is it worth it? We're often asked. And the answer, I think, to that is fairly simple. Where would we be without them? Do we really want to live in a world in which torture is normative, in which inequities are not uh, called to account? What kind of world would that be, despite our failures? The other thing I think your comment uh, alludes to uh, is the sometimes the tension between the notion of grassroots action and action mm -hmm. by expertise, lawyers, researchers, journalists. Uh, mm -hmm. This was often a, a, a conflict. Amnesty would advocate for the power of grassroots, folks who were more sympathetic to organizations focused around research and the use of the media would, would say that that was the way to go. I mean, I think it's obvious that, that, that they are complementary, that both are required. How does social change take place? It takes place by creating a virtuous circle. Often uh, the concerns uh, that warrant change are brought up from the grassroots and are supported and need to be supported by a middle level of, of uh, large numbers of people who put pressure on legislators or, or governors or judges and so on. But at the same time, if you don't have the, the academic and uh, research capacity, if you don't have the lawyers, if you don't have the media who are exposing these things, you'll never create a virtuous circle. The two go hand in hand. I found it a frustrating argument to even have to uh, to engage, but it's one that is commonly uh, focused uh, on the movement. Speaking of uh, virtuous circles, uh, so one would think uh, that human rights organizations are virtuous circles, circles of people consisting of lots of virtuous individuals, therefore should be incredibly happy places to work, right? So. Uh, a shared mission, shared sense of purpose, uh, people are in something together, people do something that each of them considers as genuinely meaningful. And yet, uh, human rights organizations have been known to be tough places to work. And I one, one thing I just really appreciate about your book, you have a whole chapter on that in there to just be very clear about, you know, why that is and certain things that unfolded and I can one can read it. Sometimes you write it explicitly, but it's also that book had a, has a certain stressful tone to it. So the, the, the mode between the lines, so there's a lot of stress in that. So you, one, one can tell that that has often been, from a leadership standpoint, organizational leadership has been quite difficult. Can you walk us through this a little bit? Why, why, why can human rights organizations of all places be sometimes such tough places to work? 
So first, let me say that part of my gratitude is that I work with so many people at Amnesty and, and in other parts of the human rights movement who displayed an enormous generosity of spirit, who are willing to uh, put themselves at great uh, w risk and expense to help other people. But you're right. I think that uh, in uh, at least in my experience in Amnesty was that it was a difficult place to work. There were many reasons for that. Uh, one is, of course, that uh, we're dealing with villains and we're dealing with uh, villains who are hard to reach. You can't confront them directly most of the time. And so uh, a certain number of people who came to Amnesty came with anger that they uh, couldn't easily express, uh, maybe personal anger at families or, or employers or whatever. And that anger was channeled into their human rights work. And some of that was enormously valuable. It pro provided great energy and power. But sometimes it would also be directed at one's co-workers or one, one's co-volunteers. Uh, because if we weren't uh, succeeding, it had to be because somebody wasn't doing something right. Uh, and that uh, is, is a difficult dynamic to confront. But I think there are other elements there. Uh, you know, I think in general, the human rights movement is reticent to take credit for its victories, to congratulate itself. Why? Well, in the first place, those victories are sometimes modest. Uh, they are sometimes temporary. You don't want to be seen as feeling triumphalist uh, because pretty soon you're going to uh, have a, another uh, loss. Uh, and uh, there is also a sense that if I rest on my laurels, if I'm not working every second, somebody may die. You know, if you're working in the environmental movement, you have a long-term perspective. And if you take a day off, it's probably not going to result in climate change being worse mm. because you, one individual, took a day off from work. But in human rights work, it's very different. Uh, there is at least the feeling, whether that's realistic or not, that if I slack off in any way, uh, it may it may cause someone enormous suffering and may even cause them their life. I yeah. used to try to tell folks, uh, you know, if you're not living a well-balanced life, if you're not healthy, you're not ultimately going to be able to help anyone else. Uh, but I think that's a tough lesson when you're dealing with life and death issues, as you are in an activist human rights organization. One other thing that, that comes up about uh, human rights organizations is that uh, they are disproportionately populated by white people. Uh, and, you know, that is something that I greatly appreciated uh, about your book also, uh, you know, as, as, as somebody who also in kind of, I mean, in a different way, needed to navigate uh, his way through the racial complexities of the United States, you know, myself not being from here. But in a way, not that then in some sense is not very different from your struggle since you came from a particular social niche and you, a lot, you, you did a lot of learning also about the what it's like character of the racial realities, uh, the what it's like character from other people's point of view in, in the United States. And yet there's this issue also specifically about human rights organizations so that it, even though it pays all this attention to discrimination. And if you look at the Universal Declaration, you know, Articles 1 and 2, they are both about discrimination. Discrimination shows up there before we even get a right to life. Why do we, why does the human rights world still have, at least in the United States, this whiteness challenge? So um, I grew up in a family where issues of racial justice were very much on the table. My father was a left-wing law professor at the University of Pittsburgh, but I was certainly myself not fully conscious of my own white privilege until late, much later in my life, uh, when I was educated uh, by experiences by uh, other people who were very generous and direct in their education of me. Um, I think it's true that some elements of the human rights movement are uh, overwhelmingly white. Um, at Amnesty, we tried very hard to appoint people to the staff, to encourage people on the board uh, who were racially diverse and economically diverse, um, a very difficult task in some contexts. We also, however, tried hard to partner with civil rights organizations to make sure that uh, around issues such as uh, police brutality or the death penalty, uh, to make sure that we were we were educating ourselves and viewing this issue 
uh, from a, through a multicultural lens. Uh, and I, I'm sure we often failed at that, uh, but uh, if indeed you believe in a grassroots movement, uh, you can't do anything other than that. And Amnesty, you alluded in your original remarks, had this rule that one worked, uh, one could not work on one's own country. That was motivated originally by the notion that if you worked on your own country, you might be forwarding some political agenda and therefore no longer be seen as neutral. Uh, but of course, the result of that restriction, which has been lifted and much more, uh, uh, much uh, uh, the, the, the whole approach has been changed since I was there. But the result of that restriction was that people who cared about issues within the United States, for example, which often involved racism, were not encouraged to work on those issues. In fact, in some respects, we're restricted from doing so. We managed to break through that and we managed to uh, engage, as I say, uh, with issues and with communities uh, that went far beyond the original uh, amnesty profile. And I think that was uh, in enormously important. Yeah, yeah. Um, to turn to in, in another American uh, issue um, the um, one 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 chapter uh, you know one very eye-opening chapter is about the engagement with uh, that amnesty had with the criminal justice domain and in particular also with the with the police um and you you know you, you talk about this phenomenon of the blue wall of silence you know so the uh, there's you know certain understanding of cohesiveness collegiality among police officers that they're not they're just protecting each other they're having each other's backs also in ways in which in in at times when they really shouldn't um, and you have been intrigued by the occasional phenomenon where somebody breaks through that and basically puts the, the spirit of the kind of service that police are supposed to be doing above any concerns that come with this, these issues around cohesiveness. And um, so you talk about the rare individuals who are willing to breach the blue wall of silence and that you consider writing a book about them, but that is not one of the books that you came around writing. Is that a book that you will still write or is that something that for good reason you have discarded bill i i actually i didn't discard it i was uh, doing interviews and and working on that book before, right before 9 11 and uh, with uh, 9 11 attack the focus of the organization of course was for the next few years uh, largely shifted in, in the direction of the violations at guantanamo and the use of torture and so on and i wrote a book instead about that but uh, I was always intrigued by that, partly because I came to know some police officers, uh, often though not exclusively African-American police officers, who had resisted the blue wall of silence. And I was intrigued as to whether I could find some common qualities, some common properties that defined that. Well, ultimately, my pool uh, was only about half a dozen people, so I can't necessarily claim that this has universal appeal. But I noticed at least two things. One is that the, the people, the officers who resisted were people who had truly gone into police work because out of an idealistic perspective. They had gone into it because they truly wanted to help people. They'd gone in it, into it often because their parents, especially their mothers, had encouraged them to be honorable people uh, and to help other people as best they can. And they initially saw police work as a way to do that. Um, and uh, they uh, often were uh, uh, became quite cynical about that or skeptical at least about it. But that was the initiative. And the second common quality was not of the officers themselves, it was of the top brass. And what seemed to be clear was that if there was one variable uh, that made a difference into those departments that did better with this issue. It was not necessarily training. It was not necessarily quotas. It was not necessarily diversifying the ranks, important as those are, but as we've seen recently in some cases where Black officers themselves were guilty of, uh, of, of uh, police misconduct. What the variable was, was pretty simple. It was that the top brass, the police chief or the police commissioner, truly insisted that officers be held accountable for misconduct. Mm. Uh, that over and over again was the issue. Sometimes, of course, they were blocked by police unions. Police unions are very powerful. Sometimes they were blocked by public opinion. 
but um, in the cases where uh, there seemed to be some progress made, it almost always involved both top brass and some officers who do uh, to do a good job. Sorry for. Yeah. Sorry, I was just temporarily distracted by the the image. <laughs> Now that we now that we saw your wife uh, on that picture, what does your wife think about your work at Amnesty? Has she been uh, happy that you were on this job with all the these ways you have endangered yourself, or has she often said to you, "Bill, not Liberia, not Northern Ireland, not a fool"? No, she ne she never said that, but I think she was uh, breathed a bit of relief when I left the job. Yeah, yeah. What do you what do you say when maybe coming to a concluding question? Um, so you know, what do you say to what do you say to to people who there's, there's various groups of skeptics, right? So there is um, there is the there's the kind of human rights skeptic people who write who write books like the End Game of Human Rights and things like that. So people who say, well, this is mostly window dressing. This really doesn't take us anywhere. You know, this is like the, you know we are kind of kidding ourselves. What do you? We touched on this a little bit, but maybe as a way of just kind of. You know, giving you the also this opportunity to address that group. You know, the, this kind of academic skeptic, and then maybe what do you say to this to another person, not a skeptic, but a person with a question, namely somebody who is thinking about doing something in the human rights domain but doesn't quite know. Especially also that we discussed this kind of tough stuff about inter organizations. So, uh, you know, should should they go? What what do I say to somebody who walks into the car and says, you know, I'm thinking about a human rights career, but I'm not sure. But what, what should I say or what would you say? So uh, the first thing I'll say is that it's quite interesting to me that most of those skeptics are uh, from the developed world. They are people who are not working day to day in the human rights trenches. What's very interesting is that uh, in the developing world, the language of human rights is often seen as enormously helpful uh, to engaging in social change. Um, the second thing I'll say is I'll, I'll reiterate what we commented on before, which was um, fine, fine, we have our faults, we uh, have our failures, we have our losses, but you wouldn't want to live in a world without human rights uh, activists, without human rights norms and values. And finally, I would make the argument that in fact, those human rights norms are the prevalent cultural norms at work in the world today. And how do, why do I say that? Because the tyrants themselves give the game away. Why is it that Vladimir Putin has framed his war in Ukraine as a, an effort to denazify Ukraine? Why is it that Xi Jinping claims that his is an emerging democracy and that re-education through labor camps are in fact legitimate institutions? Uh, over and over again, we see that even the worst violators of human rights recognize that they need to frame their horrendous actions in terms that are consistent with global human rights values. Uh, and while of course they violate those values uh, on a whim, nonetheless, the cultural norm at the global level is a prevailing human rights norm. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, you start with having established a cultural norm. You then have to go on and enforce it, of course, with political, economic, and sometimes military elements. But if you don't have the underlying cultural norm, you'll never be successful in the other more pragmatic realms. And that I think is part of what the human rights movement does and does very successfully is yeah. establish those baseline cultural norms. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that is a very powerful note um, to end on. Uh, so let me just um, maybe say again, uh, yes, there's a, you know, it lies in the nature of the human rights movement itself that it sees a lot of half empty glasses, right, rather than half full glasses. It lies in the nature of the human rights movement that it focuses on things that are that are not done, that it focuses on people whose challenges in uh, in society have uh, have not been met. And so in, in, a, in that sense, the human rights movement contributes itself to this awareness that there's all these problems in the world that, you know, that they get attention, that they that there's reporting about them. Uh, but I think it's just really important just to keep in mind, uh, you know, this, uh, which can be accomplished by doing this.
easy subtitles to get a tentative sense of what the world would be like if all this work that human rights organizations do uh, on humanitarian organizations like the Red Cross, if that were not in the world, if the world were simply left to the to the people who don't uh, do that work, that's I think is a healthy thought experiment. And you know, then of course for those of us who are in this uh, in in this in this line of work, I think what you the the epi graph at the beginning is incredibly useful. Uh, we are uh, not obligated to complete the work. It is not possible to complete the work. We could not have possibly the ambition of going into this line of line of work with the ambition of creation, creating a completeness, but we are not permitted uh, to not do this work. And we are obligated to continue this work. And uh, Bill, you have you have done your share. You have definitely done your share. So the thing to say at the end again is uh, thank you for that. Uh, so you, uh, this session was meant to be as a way of paying homage to your work. And I want to say to all of you, uh, the book is absolutely fascinating uh, as a human rights journey and also as one illustration of what that means to feel an obligation to to do some of the work without being able to complete it. And, in that spirit, thank you all for your support for the CAR Center and thank you, Bill, in particular, for all you do. And uh, academic year is over, um, but, uh, you know, the work is not complete. There's going to be a next year. Uh, there's going to be another year. So I hope to see you at CAR Center events then. Take care, everybody.